Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, I feel the anointing. All right. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. What an honor for me to be here. And uh, I love Dan and Patty. And we were, as Dan shared, uh, working together on the board of ICA. And what a refreshing uh, uh, move of the Holy Spirit here in Tacoon. And uh, you are really on the cutting edge of what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing globally. And so it's really my honor to be in covenant relationship with you. I feel I'm here to receive an impartation from you. And I sincerely mean that. And I feel it's a very surreal time for me because when I received the invitation, my year was already booked. And the only reason why this week was available is because today is my grandson's fourth birthday. And I was not going to travel around his birthday. And, and I knew I would come back from China. I came back from China and Russia last week. And then I'm off again next week. And I'm off to, believe it or not, Russia again, but this time I was in Vladivostok and now I'm headed towards Moscow, the other side of, of Russia. And, uh, and so initially I thought, no way can I accept this invitation. It was last minute, a few months out, and uh, my, my son's birthday, is, uh, my grandson's birthday is on May 29th. And it's also my spiritual birthday, I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. But, but um, I felt so impressed by the Holy Spirit. It's amazing, you know, when, when Solomon asked for, for wisdom, he really didn't ask for wisdom. He asked for a hearing heart. That Hebrew word Shema. Same word in Deuteronomy 6, Shema, Israel. The Lord your God is one. And so I, I've been really asking, Lord, give me a hearing heart. I, I really want to be led by you prophetically. And so uh, when I got the invitation, uh, I just felt this nudge to accept the invitation. And, but I had to call my daughter. And I called my daughter and I said, uh, hey, what are we doing for Justice's uh, fourth birthday? And, and she said, well, Dad, on the 29th, we want to celebrate as a family, but we're going to do it uh, with the rest of the family members on Monday night. And, and I told her why. I said, you know, I've been invited to speak at a very important conference, but, you know, I don't want to leave uh, because, you know, I've basically carved out the time to be with Justice. And, and she said, Dad, be totally released. And when she said that, I felt the, the wind of God, the rook of God. I felt like this incredible release uh, to be here. And so I immediately emailed back and said, I accept the invitation, what an honor for me to be here. And I feel I'm here by divine appointment. And then it hit me, like when I arrived on Wednesday, it hit me that my spiritual anniversary, I got saved at a Deep Purple concert at the Baltimore Civic Center 20 minutes from here. And I will be preaching on the anniversary of my conversion here at this conference. Isn't that amazing? God is so good. I'm still trying to figure out the prophetic significance of that. But what are the odds of me traveling all over the world that I you know, would be in the very, very area, the region area of the city that I got saved? And just have to share, I grew up in the East Coast, and it's great to be back in Maryland. I grew up in uh, Rockville, Maryland, and went to Magruder High School, went to the University of Maryland, I'm a Turk, and uh, I'm an Oriole fan, I mean, I'm being a Redskins fan, go with Skins. But once, once, you know, you, you get into the Skins, you, it just never leaves you. So here I'm in Los Angeles still uh, tracking with the Redskins and, uh, and the Orioles, and, uh, and so, but anyway, um, I grew up here, and uh, my dad uh, was invited to be the pastor of the first Korean Southern Baptist Church in North America. It was in Washington, D.C. in 1958. But we had some visa problems, so the rest of the family, my mom, my sister, and me, we came in 1960. And we came uh, to Forest Grove Elementary School. I remember moving in uh, Silver Spring and went to this elementary school that was an all-white school. Uh, there were no people of color. I can't remember anyone of color until the fifth grade when someone from Afghanistan of all the places came, a student from Afghanistan. So my sister and I were the only two people of color. And how I many you know growing up in elementary school when you're, you know, different, they're going to let you know. The kids, they don't have manners, you know, they, they, they're not taught yet to, to not to be rude, not to be a racist. And I was called everything from being a, a chain, even though I'm not Chinese. To being called a Jap, even though I'm not Japanese. I'm Korean, by the way, okay? Now, just a side issue here, we know how to tell the difference, by the way, when you're talking to the Chinese. We can tell the difference between Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Would you like to learn a little cross culture tip so you can be sensitive to know how to tell the difference when you see it? It's very, very simple. If you see a rich looking Asian, they're Chinese. China has just surpassed us in GDP, seriously. It's amazing, the growth, the economic growth. 
in China. If you see a, a smart looking Asian, they're Japanese. They'll take whatever we invent and make it better. <laughs> but if you see a handsome looking Asian, <laughs> he's Korean, so that's how you talk to but I grew up here you know, and during the 60s, it was just a real turbulent time. The war in Vietnam was taking place and they called me Vietnamese and Viet Cong and got in fights all the time. And I wanted to be so accepted by my American friends. I was so insecure. And, um, and so when the whole drug hippie culture came in, I just gave myself to that. I gave myself to rebellion and I, I shared with the leaders this morning, I may have been the first Korean hippie in North America, I'm not sure. <laughs> But I gave myself to hippiedom and that calls and I stopped cutting my hair and I started to take drugs and by the time I was 15 I was doing everything under the sun from heroin to cocaine. By the time I was 17 I was a drug addict. And um, I was a high school dropout. At Magruder High School I, I dropped out of school which is the unpardonable sin for a nation. I mean, <laughs> the whole purpose of coming to this country is to get an education and for me to be a, a high school dropout I mean you know, my dad, God bless him, when I was 15, I got busted in Ocean City, Maryland, and had to drive three hours to pick me up and get me out of jail. And so you can imagine how heartbroken it was when I dropped out of school. I was just out of control. I was so rebellious. But my parents, they, they, they couldn't communicate with me, but they just knew how to pray. And as Koreans, they were praying all the time. And, and uh, my grandmother was praying for me. And by the way, my grandmother just passed away last year at the age of 101. Yeah, God bless her. Thank God for her longevity. And that's a good prophetic word, Psalm 91, for all of you who are my age and getting older. With a long life, I'm going to satisfy you. Can I hear an amen? amen. And so, and by the way, when your grandmother's praying for you, you don't have a chance. You're going to get saved. And that's what happened to me. I got rightly touched by the Holy Spirit at a party two weeks before the Deep Purple concert, I really was crying out and I was searching and I was into Eastern religion, I was into Zen Buddhism, I was chanting the stupid chant and incessantly, as many of you know that chant, and so you know a lot of you came out of that background as well, but, but just being frustrated, just feeling empty, I cried out to God at the party, I said, God, I don't even know if you exist, but if you do exist, if what my parents told me as a little boy is true, that Jesus is the way, that there's a heaven and there's a hell. Well, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven, but I don't know the truth. I just want the truth. And right there, the presence of God came into the room. I felt this perfect love envelop me. I could not stop weeping for like two, three days. Just, un the presence would hit me. I would just break down and start to weep. And I, of course, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know it was the presence of God. But I knew that Jesus was indeed the way, the truth, and life. I knew it without anyone witnessing to me or sharing with me. The seeds were planted by my parents. But I didn't want to give up my sins. And so I was still part of it every single day. I was doing drugs every single day. Every night I was out with my friends. I had a girlfriend at that time. We were sleeping around. And so here I was living in sin, and I didn't want to give this, this lifestyle up. I knew now I had the revelation, right? But my conscience was awakened. So now, two weeks later, I'm at a Deep Purple concert at the Baltimore Civic Center. And we had the best seat in the auditorium, like third row, third row, right in the center of the auditorium. And, um, and Deep Purple was the number one band. I mean, the tickets sold in like two hours. I mean, it was just unbelievable. 15,000, they had the number one song, Smoke on the Water. How many know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys are looking at me like, who the heck is Deep Purple? Well, I know, I know that dates me, but, uh, but they were hot at one time. And so, and so anyway, uh, so there was another band, Rory Gallagher, before Deep Purple came on. And during the intermission, my friends are walking around just pick, trying to pick up some girls. And, and I'm sitting there saving their seats. And I'm thinking about the encounter I had two weeks before. And I'm saying, God... Let me make a deal with you. I was saying, can I just smoke con? I won't sell anymore. I'll give off, I'll give off the hot hard stuff, but I, you know. And it's okay to have sex as long as you like the person and, and it's a committed relationship. And so I'm feeling smug about my newfound theology. <laughs> and all of a sudden, two guys come and they sit down right next to me. I thought they were crashing the concert and, and they were moving forward. And so I leaned over to tell them that the seats are taken. But before I could get a word out, the guy sitting next to me says, I know what you're thinking about. You think you're right with God, but you're not right with Him yet. You have to really show God that you're really serious about following Him. And that's all they said. With those words, they stood up. And my hair stood up. 
I think down I said, who were these guys? To this day, I have no clue who they were. I don't know they're radical Christians going into a concert giving a word of knowledge or they're two angels. I have no clue. But it so rocked me. And I said to God, God, what do you want me to do? And I heard the voice of God for the first time. Throw away your drugs, leave this concert, and follow me. I had brought a pound of marijuana with me into the concert. A pound. I had brought a water pipe, the same one that Michael Phelps used to. And you know, I had preludes on me. I mean, I had the, 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 the choice drugs you could want. And to throw it away, I mean, it was just everything within my flesh. And no, there's no way I'm going to do that. But I heard his voice and I threw it on the ground. I remember someone picking it up, like, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> they didn't say that, but it was like... And all of a sudden, Deep Purple comes on, Smoke on the Water is the first song. Smoke is pouring out of the stage. The lights are flashing. The people run up to the front. I'm trapped with 15,000. I'm up at the front. So I could rationalize, I'm stuck up here, there's no way I can leave this concert. But I heard him say, leave this concert. I had to be intentional about leaving a Deep Purple concert. So I fought my way through a sea of people. And it was amazing because I was stuck. I said, I don't even have a, a, a car because my friend drove me. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. There was no cell phones, there was no way of communicating. And then I just felt this impression, I'm just going to hitchhike home. And I took out my thumb, and the first car that picked me up in Baltimore took me all the way to my house in Flower Valley, Rockville, Maryland. Oh it was an amazing, unbelievable night. But that was the last time I did drugs. And I've been clean for the last 42 years. I've never gone back, never taken a side coke and compromised. It's been, it's been an amazing journey. So that was exactly 42 years ago today, May 29th. Because I, you know, I actually didn't know until uh, later on. I said, you know, I'm going to Google if there's anything about Deep Purple at the Baltimore City Center in 1973. And sure enough, an article came on and gave the date, May 29th. I said, now I know when I got saved. And, uh, and so it happens to be my grandson's birthday as well. And here I am celebrating this in a very amazing way, just 30 minutes out from the Civic Center here at this conference. And I had no idea when I accepted the invitation all these things were converged. I still don't know what it means, but I feel like I'm in God's courage moment and I'm in the right place. Tell the person next to you that you're in the right place. Tell them right now you're in the right place at the right time. You're in the right place. I want to give away some books that I've had the privilege to write. And uh, before I do that, let me just uh, give this to Paul. That was amazing worship. But this is done by our worship leader. We are loved. It hit number 17 in the iTunes chart. And, uh, it's just all original music from uh, Kenny Peavy, and God's just really raised him up to be a real prophetic uh, worship leader. And so I'll give this, to, let me give this to you, Paul, right now. Thank you so much for the amazing uh, worship tonight. I've so enjoyed that. Now, this book came out two years ago, The Grace of Giving, and uh, basically it really is about how God wants to bless you so you could be a blessing to the nations, and so it's uh, prosperity with a purpose, and... Um, it's just one of my life messages, and so I'll talk a little bit about this tonight. Let me go over the Reformers' Pledge. The Lord just gave me uh, this uh, word on Reformation and Revival, but instead of me writing about it, I asked my friends, and so Bill Johnson, Lance Walnut, Chuck Pierce, Heidi Baker, Peter Wagner, James Gall, John Arnott, Cindy Jacobs, Lou Engel, Jim Garlow. Uh, it's just an amazing book. In fact, I shared this morning that uh, James Gall, who was bedridden last year because of back surgery, had a visitation. Jesus held this book and said, this is the book of the hour. And it's not because I wrote it. I didn't write it, but uh, it's not because James has a chapter. Uh, James wouldn't share that if it didn't happen. And so it was very, very significant that that would be a testament out of this book. And then How to Pray for Healing. Uh, this is a book that's just been reprinted over and over again. It's one of my bestsellers. And I want to do a healing service tonight. We want to pray for the sick. And, but if you would like to be equipped and how to pray for the sick, or if you're contending for healing your own body and you want more, I highly recommend this book as well. And then I have brought a number of uh, uh, teaching series, uh, CDs here. Uh, this is called Fulfilling Your Prophetic Destiny. How many know everyone has a destiny? Amen. Amen. And so how do you discover your destiny? How do you fulfill your prophetic destiny? And I'm not going to give these away because I only have a few of each. I'm going to give the books away, but this one is The Power of Blessing, and I want to talk about uh, the blessing of the Lord tonight. But who is celebrating a birthday today? Anyone having a birthday today? We have one. Anyone else? How about tomorrow night? 
Okay, we have two. How about on uh, Sunday? Anyone? Okay, the three of you, come on up here. That's cool. Happy birthday. Let's wish him a happy birthday. And then we pass it out to your friends. God bless you. And listen, after the service, after the healing service, I'm going to hang around. I'll do some book signing and uh, I want to give you a prophetic word. Just bless you. Thank you for supporting the ministry. All the proceeds go to World Missions. And it's just a choice I've made uh, over the years. And, uh, and it's so cool to, to be equipped, but also in part uh, and to give to the nations. And so uh, I'll be out there by the table, my table out there. And uh, love to meet you and sign your book. Well, I want to pray. Let's just, um, let's just be kind enough just to stand with me. Let's just welcome the Holy Spirit. I, I spoke this morning to the leaders on hosting the Holy Spirit. And uh, I really believe we're on the verge of another way. You feel it in yes. there, don't you? Yeah. And uh, we've had waves of the Holy Spirit. Even in my lifetime, I got saved during the Jesus People Movement, at least on the East Coast version of it, in 73, even though it started in 67 in Costa Mesa, California. Then I got hit with uh, the third wave with John Wimber, when I went to Fuller Seminary, MC 510, Science and Wonders and Church Growth. Then 1994, I got blasted by the Toronto outpouring. It seems like there's just been a gap of like 20 years, but I feel we're on the verge of another way. Amen. I shared this morning how Lauren Cunningham had an incredible visitation January of 2014. He saw a tsunami wave hitting the globe, and the Lord told me that the, the Lord told him that the greatest harvest, the greatest revival that, that we have yet to see is coming, is imminent. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you for your presence here. We want more of you. Amen. And Lord, we ask that you would fill us afresh with your spirit. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Yeshua. Will it explode in our hearts and our minds? We ask that you would transform us from glory to glory. That we are not just to be here to be intellectually stimulated, but we want to receive an impartation of the Holy Spirit that will lead to the transformation of our lives, that you would impart to us that revival spirit, make us all revivalists, make us all reformers. And so we thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Abba God. We receive from you in Yeshua, HaMashiach's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about 10 decrees, 10 decrees of blessing. And I want to give you the genesis of how this message came uh, about. I have a prophet friend from Kansas City named Bob Hartley. You may have heard of him, but he's not an itinerant speaker. He's a businessman. He's a very successful businessman. In fact, the uh, property that IHOP uses is owned by Bob Hartley. And so he's just a quiet man behind the scenes, but a very successful businessman. But he's very, very prophetic. When I first met him, he gave me my birth date and my wife's birth date. And that got my attention. And then when he prophesied over me, he started to prophesy over my children by name. I had to stop him. I said, did you look me up on Facebook? And he said, no, I don't really even know how to do Facebook. And, and since then, uh, uh, it's true. He doesn't know how to even, uh, you know, to text or even send out emails. He's just, he's just not wired that way. Um, but anyway, he got my attention. And, um, and so a year ago, he phoned me and left a message on my voicemail. And he said, the Lord has given me this word for you that you're to to give ten apostolic decrees wherever you go decrees a blessing and that was the message and so I called him and I said Bob that's fantastic I mean that's really good because I'm always looking for the next word that I'm supposed to deliver so can you give me the ten decrees <laughs> and as we're talking he said I don't have a clue I don't know what the decrees are but I just know that you're to make these ten decrees I think you've got to really hear from God and wait on the Lord I said, thanks a lot. But anyway, but it was really God because I, it, it caused me to seek his face. I said, okay, 10 decrees. Now, what's a decree? A decree is a form of prayer. Most of Jesus' prayers were decrees. With a withered uh, hand, he said, stretch forth your hand. And the man stretched forth his hand. Take up your uh, mat and walk. Uh, to the storm, be still, be muzzled. There are decrees, and kings make decrees. But how many know we're also kings? Amen. The Bible says you're a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2 9. The Bible says in Revelation 1 6 that we are kings and priests. And also in Revelation 5 10, we're kings and priests. So I believe when the Bible says he's the king of kings, 
that yes, it does include geopolitical monarchs like Prince Charles will one day be the king of England, but I believe he's talking about you. He's the king of kings, us. We are royalty. We need to know that. And so we need to make decrees. And, and so, uh, uh, but when it comes to decreeing, it's really important to be prophetic to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying for you to decree. You can't just lose a new Mercedes Benz and bind whatever you know you want to bind. You've got to hear from God. In fact, in Matthew 16, 19, Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That way that reads in the Greek is whatever you bind on earth will first have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will first have been loose in heaven. So what does that mean? It means that heaven must initiate. See, prayer is not just talking to God, but it's hearing from Him and then praying what He wants you to pray. You know, Kierkegaard said, I thought prayer was talking to God, but I realized the more I prayed that prayer is listening to God, yes. waiting on Him, hearing what He's saying, and then praying what He wants you to pray. Of course, you know, we can pray the Word. There's certain things that we can pray, the will of God. But I'm talking about prayer that's prophetic. When it comes to decrees, you just don't want to go ahead and decree things in the flesh. You want to really hear from God. So, for example, I was the president of the call, a youth prayer movement from 2000 to 2003. And we did seven stadium events beginning with Washington, D.C. and the Washington Mall. How many of you remember the call and were part of the call? All right, so that's, that's a good representation here. But, uh, but we also did a few international calls during that, uh, my tenure. We went to Berlin, we went to London, and we went to Seoul. And we rented out Olympic Stadium in 2002. And, uh, and whenever we do a call, we're always checking the weather report, right? Because this outdoors is a stadium event, or, you know, we began at the mall. And that week in Korea, it was just torrential rain all, all week. And, uh, and so I'm talking with Lou Engel, the founder of the call. I said, Lou, maybe we should cancel it, postpone it. Radical, he said, I don't care if it's rain, it's going to be raining. We're going to be in the mud, we're going to be in the rain. This is a, a fast, it's not a festival, you know. It's a, it's a time to sacrifice. And so he said, forget you know, about the weather, we're going to still have the event. So I said, okay, let's have the event. But unfortunately, you know, what we were expecting was a, uh, a stadium full of people. We still had over 50,000 show up. And by the way, that's not an exaggeration, because when you do a stadium event, you actually count. Because every turnstile calculates into one count, and you get a, a, a specific number of how many people are in the stadium. So we had over 50,000 there, but they were all undercover, because it was pouring rain. And so no one was out there praying with us. It was just people on the platform. We had covering, of course, and then uh, people were walking around. And so even with, you know, two hours of prayer, Lou is really getting frustrated and because, you know, people aren't engaging. And so he leans over to me and says, you need to make an apt solid decree that will stop raining. I looked at him and I said, if you got that word, you make that decree. You pray that. I'm not getting up there to make that decree. But then he says, you're an apostle. And, and I understand that because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And Paul uses very strong Greek words, proton, deuteron, triton. And if you look up that word proton and strong's concordance, it talks about first in authority. All right. And so he leans over to me, you're the apostle, you need to make an apostolic decree. I said, did you really hear from the Lord? He said, yeah, I really believe that we need to pray that it would stop raining so we could pray. So I get up to the mic and I say, brothers and sisters, wherever you are in the stadium, just stop. Grab someone's hand. I want to make a decree that would stop raining. And so I made a decree in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name, it would stop raining. And there were 50,000 people there. Within 10 minutes, the rain stopped, the clouds parted, and this beautiful sunshine came down upon the stadium for the rest of the day. We had First two hours of journey, but the next 10 hours was sunshine. It was in November, it was unusually warm. And then, um, and so we had a wonderful time, and then uh, the rest of the story is, is pretty amazing because uh, my kids were with me, and so, you know, they're encountering this incredible phenomenon of answer to prayer, and so we're driving away from the stadium as we're headed back to our hotel, it starts to rain again. And I'm saying to my kids, I said, isn't God so cold that he would stop the rain for the call event? And now that it's over, it's starting to rain. So, you know, the kids are saying, yeah, God is so good. And, you know, we're praising and worshiping him in the car. But when I got to the hotel, I found out it was raining around the city all day. But just over our stadium, it was not raining. Did we give Yeshua all the glory? It was the most amazing day. 
And so I started to learn about decrees and, uh, and apostolic decrees. And I'm saying this to build your faith because I want to make decrees over you. And I want to receive things that will shift your life and change your life. And, and so uh, just recently, actually it wasn't that recent, it was 2013, Colorado Springs, and uh, my, my mentor and my apostle, Peter Wagner, Dr. Peter Wagner, uh, was a uh, professor of, uh, of church growth for 30 years, and then he started his own seminary in 1998, but he lived there. He just recently moved to Dallas around a month ago, but he lived in Colorado Springs in 2013. And this major uh, forest fire was breaking out all throughout I mean, it was like the worst fire in the history of Colorado Springs, the Black Forest fires, and uh, you had firefighters from like four or five different states trying to put it out, but they couldn't put it out. The reason why, there was a major drought for months before the forest fire hit, and it was on the front page of the news, and I have a lot of friends in Colorado Springs, so I was just tracking uh, the, the fire, and, uh, and I'm in Seattle now speaking at a friend's church, and I get a phone call from Cindy Jacobs. I may have heard of Cindy Jacobs, she's a major prophet in the body of Christ. And she calls me and says, Che, I really felt from the Lord that you're to make an apostolic decree that it would rain over Colorado Springs and the fire would go out. I said, Cindy, I've been tracking the weather. There's no rain in the forecast at all. In fact, there's been this drought because, you know, for months. And that's why we had the forest fire. Are you hearing from the Lord? She said, yeah, I really heard from the Lord. I, I called Peter. He was in Denver. He had to evacuate, move to Denver. And uh, I called him. I asked him to make a decree, and you're the only other apostle I've called to make a decree. And I said, well, listen, I'm in uh, Seattle, Washington, but I'll share with uh, the church congregation. And, and tonight, with this was Friday afternoon, I said, that we'll, we'll, do, we'll pray. So um, at the beginning of the meeting, just like getting up here, I just said, can we just pause for a moment? I got a call from Cindy Jacobs this afternoon, and she wants us to make a decree that it would rain over Colorado Springs. And would you just stand with me, and, and we'll make this decree together. So we made the decree and then went through the service. We had the service, wonderful service. But that night, out of nowhere, a cloud started to form the size of immense fits over Colorado Springs. And it started to grow and started to grow. And it rained that night sufficiently uh, for the firefighters to put out the fire. And it was front page of the Denver Post. They said this storm came out of nowhere. I mean, no, uh, God is in control. Amen. But you've got to hear from God. You can't just find a news. You've got to be prophetically led. And so I wanted to share with you, I've been waiting on the Lord, and I got these ten decrees of blessing. Now, the, the purpose of the blessing, you need to understand, and, and this is really important because I feel Psalm 67 is really a, a, a key psalm uh, and maybe a key chapter for this prophetic uh, moment that we're in. And if you could turn with me to Psalm 67, and I want to just read a first few verses. And they may even have it. Uh, they may have it up there, and that's cool. They do have it up there. But here is the psalm. The psalmist begins by saying, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. And he's almost quoting the ironic blessing found in number 6, 24. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and show you shalom of Yeshua. Amen. I'm adding a few words there, but, but it says blessing because God is a God of blessing. Amen. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, he, when he created man in his image, in the image of God, he created them. He first blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Why? Because he's a God of love. He's a father. He's, an, he's our Abba Daddy. He, he delights in blessing his children. How many of you have children? How many of you have grandchildren like me? All right. And, and I have two more on the way. I can't wait. You know, it's just so exciting. It's the exciting time in my life. And I love to bless my children. I love to bless, you know, and when my kids were small, they're all grown up. My oldest is 35. My youngest is 30. And, and uh, two of them are pastors. In fact, my son, the 35-year-old, is going to take over the church. We're installing him as a new senior pastor in January when I turn 60. Come on. And so, you know, what a great what a great life to pass on legacy to the next generation, just like Benjamin with uh, uh, Rabbi Daniel. And just uh, we're just proud of you guys. You know, take the baton and go for it because this is a double portion generation. Yes. I believe my son's generation and Rabbi Jason and the, your generation is going to do way beyond anything we ever right. experienced or saw. 
because we're going from glory to glory. Can I hear an amen? amen. And so, now we get to be part of it because we're going to get the tail end of it, you know, I mean, as we're winding down our ministry, and I, I'm still believing God for a good 20, 30 years ahead. My grandmother lived to 101, so, you know, I'm believing God for longevity, but, but I really feel you're not a success unless you have a successor. Amen. And it's all about empowerment. It's all about giving things away. It's a father's heart, including blessing others with the ministry that God's given you the privilege to steward. And so, um, so anyway, um, God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the enemy, and take dominion. And so we see him blessing Abraham before his name was changed to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And he says, I'm going to bless you so all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So this is the purpose. Here in Psalm 67, it says the same thing. Bless us so that your way may be known on earth and salvation among the nations. This is so amazing that your blessing would determine the salvation of nations. Because they're going to see you have something I don't have. I see your marriage. I see your family life. I see God prospering you financially, blessing you. But more important, we have something they don't have, and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm in Hollywood, right 20 minutes from uh, downtown Hollywood, and they spend billions of dollars on movies, especially on special effects. But how many of you know we have something that even Hollywood doesn't have, and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit that transcends everything. And so, so I believe is, is going to, there's going to come a time where we're going to really let our light shine before the world, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. So God wants to bless you. And it's as hard to bless you because it will lead to the salvation of nations. And so with that in mind, I want you to be in faith to receive the 10 decrees of blessing. Are you ready? Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a decree first, and then I'm going to unpack it and explain a little bit about the, each decree. And then I'm going to say it again in an apostolic way, and I want you to receive it by faith, and I want you to give me a big amen. Amen. Amen means so be it, or, or you know, or you could say I receive it, or hallelujah, whatever. But I think there needs to be some kind of response. All right? And so let's go through the decrees. And the first decree is about love. I decree a blessing over you that God will grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God's love so that you can love and worship God and love others. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah. <laughs> Amen. I'll say it again, but let me explain. Uh, as, as I was quoting Shema Israel, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus adds mind to it. But we're to love God with all of our heart. And to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? And for me, uh, the Christian life is reduced to one word. It's reduced to love. God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8, and also verse 16. And uh, when I was uh, a brand new convert, I knew I was called into ministry. This is going back to 1973, 74. But I didn't know what kind of ministry I was called to. I thought, well, maybe I'm called to be a pastor, maybe an evangelist. And, and immediately I was just so attracted to Billy Graham and I wanted to be like him and, and I love winning souls. And so, But I, I didn't know what, what my calling and I didn't really understand the apostolic or prophetic, but I decided to go on a fast. I'm not talking big fast, I'm just talking about fasting a day and, and to just really seek his face and to say, God, I, I really want to know my calling. And so I fasted and... It was around the afternoon after lunch, what would have been lunchtime for me, I heard him say, and I knew it was of the Lord because this was not on my radar. He said, I've called you to a ministry of love. I said, what? <laughs> I never even heard of that. I mean, I, you know, why not you're going to be the next Billy Graham or something like that, right? But how many know we're all called to the ministry of love? Amen. If we can prophesy, if we can move mountains, if we have not love, we have absolutely nothing. Bob Jones was a friend of mine, and um, I had a chance to see him uh, right before he passed away on February 14, 2014. He was an eccentric prophet, and we ministered a lot of conferences together. But uh, many of you may not know this, that he almost died in 1973. He had a brain aneurysm, and he was rushed to the hospital. They operated on him, and he actually died on the operation table, and his spirit went into heaven. And he was before the judgment seat of Christ. He knew he was in heaven. He knew that he was going to be in heaven. There are other people in line waiting to get into heaven. And Jesus was giving out rewards. Isn't it amazing? As Christians, we're not judged whether we go to heaven or not, but it's basically what kind of reward we're going to receive. Uh, the great day of judgment is different from the judgment seat of Christ. And he was before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And Jesus asked him one question. Jesus asked him, did you learn how to love? And when he was asked the question, he was just, you know, exposed. And uh, he said no. Because he felt like he didn't love his family well, he didn't love his wife well. And, uh, and so he had this prophetic invitation. He could stay, be in heaven, or go back and learn how to love. He chose to go back to her. And the next thing he knew, he was back in his body. They did a successful operation. And, and um, he lived until he was 80 years old. And amazingly, he died on Valentine's Day, 2014. I think he learned a little bit how to love. Amen. That was a prophetic time to be home with the Lord. And so if the Lord asked you, did you learn how to love? What would you say? I, I want to encourage you to make love your aim, make love your goal. And I'm praying that you would receive a spirit of revelation of how much the Father loves you, how much Abba God loves you. Because in 1 John 4, 16 says, we love because He first loved us. We can only give away love once we receive it. So let me make the decree, and I want to receive the impartation of this by faith, that you would be lovers of God, you would be worshipers of God. So with the authority God's given to me as an apostle in the body of Christ, I decree a blessing over you that God will grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God's love so that you can love and worship God and love others. Now give me a big amen. 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 All right, receive that. Decree number two, the grace of God. I decree a blessing over you that you will grow in the grace of God and be a person of grace and truth and that His grace will give you the power and favor to fulfill your destiny. Now, I love the grace of God. I'm here by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. And just sharing you my testimony, you know, this is the grace of God. By grace, we have been saved through faith. Not that of ourselves. It is a gift of God. And, and so, to me, I, I believe grace is more of the power to transform you. You know, I, some people define grace as a uh, merit of favor. Uh, but to me, it's more the power. And, um, and, and it changed my life. It was just supernatural to be delivered instantly of drug addiction. It's the grace of God. Now I believe that you can go through personal deliverance and 12-step program. I'm all for that. Whatever will help you. But I like that one-step program, amen, where the power of God hits you and you're just delivered. And, and that's what happened to me. And I just say, God, you are so good. But you know, it's amazing how right now there's teachings that is just sort of baffling me, but actually it's been throughout church history. You have people who would move into hyper grace. Yeah. For them, grace means that you can, okay, we're saved by grace, we're loved and accepted by God, and so now we could do whatever we want to do, and fornicate, sin, do drugs, hey, we're going to go to heaven. And, uh, and that's not the grace of God. That's misuse in the word. Here's the balance. I feel it's John 1, 7, 2. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Yeshua. Now this is really important because Yeshua is a man of grace, amen? He imparts grace, he gives grace, but he's still a person of truth. And the truth of the law, of the Torah, hasn't changed at all. Which of the Ten Commandments you want to throw out? Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. I mean, come on. It's amazing how people are saying, you know, that's Old Testament now, we're under grace. That's not biblical teaching. Amen. In fact, Jesus said, come on, Jesus said, listen, heaven and earth will pass away, but not a dot, not a yoda will be passed from the word of God. Can I hear an amen? Am I speaking to light here? And so I love the grace, but we want to be people of truth. And that's a balance. The Torah and the New Testament, the old and new, you have to bring it together. In fact, for me, it's amazing because as a nation, I like to I love to witness to Jewish people. And when I witness to them, I said, you know, my God is also the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they look at me, did you convert to Judaism? <laughs> but I tell them, no, I got grafted in, you know. I just came in. And then Christianity is relatively new. Korea, we, the missionaries came in 1880. And um, it's so new. Uh, but I'm here by the grace of God. And thank you, American missionaries, for sending uh, a missionary to what is now Pyongyang. And my great-great-grandmother was one of the first converts from an American missionary that began this incredible legacy of, of conversions. And my dad was a pastor, on, and, and I'm talking about on my, my father's side, and even on my mother's side, three generations of Christians. And now I'm the pastor, my son's a pastor, and we're just so blessed because of the grace of God. So are you ready to receive more grace? Yeah. All right, so let me make this decree over you. I decree a blessing over you that you will grow in the grace of God and be a person of grace and truth, and that His grace will give you the power and favor to fulfill your destiny. Amen. All 
All right, let's keep the altitude up, all right? All right. Decree number three, the power of the Holy Spirit. A decree of blessing will read that you will be full of the power of the Holy Spirit, be activating the gifts of the Spirit, and shift the spiritual atmosphere by His Holy Presence wherever you go. Now, this, this thing is huge for me, because for me, I shared uh, in HIM in our church, we say the presence of God is not just the icing on the cake. It is the cake. We're right after His presence. We want to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, and for me, uh, those who are led by the Spirit will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You can be holy without the Holy Spirit. And we need to constantly drink of the Holy Spirit. And uh, just like I need water. Can I get my water, by the way? I may get my seat back there. Thanks. And, and uh, you know, it's ridiculous for us to just even go a day without uh, a you know, number of liters of water. But, you know, we, we have this mentality. Well, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1974 and spoken tongues, and I don't need more. I'm already, I perceived it. No, we need to receive more. The Holy Spirit's moving in waves. And we're going from glory to glory. And you want to be a God chaser. You want to make sure that you don't miss the next move of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be like Jacob, who wrestled with the angel. I am not going to let you go until you bless me. You've got to have that kind of tenacity. You've got to have this kind of hunger. Yeshua said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled in Matthew 5, verse 6. It's those who hunger and thirst, they're going to get filled. And so God wants you to be filled. And here's what I want you to do I want you to put your hand on your chest as I make the decree. And when I make the decree, I want you to, by faith, receive a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. So it says in Ephesians 5, 18, do not be drunk with wine, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. I know it says filled, but in the Greek it's in the continual present tense. So the way it reads is to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? So as I make this decree, I want you to receive a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. You may want to just breathe in the Holy Spirit. He's omnipresent everywhere. And just breathe in as you receive this decree. I decree a blessing over you that you will be full of the power of the Holy Spirit, be active in the gifts of the Spirit, and shift the spiritual atmosphere by His Holy Presence wherever you go. Go ahead and give me a big amen. Now, just go ahead and receive more of the Holy Spirit. Let's just pause for a moment. Just wait on the Holy Spirit. That's it. Come, Holy Spirit, more. More of your Spirit, more of your power. And the Holy Spirit touches each person differently. A brother came up to me this afternoon and he said you laid hands on me at the leadership uh, this morning's meeting and I didn't feel anything I said look it's not based on feeling just received by faith it's interesting how the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples like a mighty rushing wind the whole place shook tons of fire a lot of manifestation but the same Holy Spirit came upon Jesus like a dove very gently same spirit same power from that point on he moves in the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So just receive. Now here's what I want us to do. I'm going to take one more step. I want you to put your hand on the person uh, that's sitting next to you on your shoulder and just pray a blessing over them. Pray that God will just fill them more of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and just pray. God, fill my sister and my brother more with the Holy Spirit. I'll give them more of you. I said, just pray right now. In part, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And increase it. More, more, more of your love, more of your presence, more of Holy Spirit. Fill them. Thank you, Lord. We're in the Zechariah 4, 6 days, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. More, more Yeshua. Breathe on each breath. The breath of God, the rule of God. Just receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Yeshua's name. <laughs> receive in Yeshua's name. More. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now let's give him a clap offering. If you receive it by faith, just thank the Lord. Identity. Decree number four, identity. Then my offer, can you hear me okay? Is, is the same sound like? Okay, very good. Thanks. Identity. I decree a blessing over you that you would know who you are in Christ, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, that you're God's friend, God's child, and as his bride, you're called to reign in life together with Jesus forever. Now, uh, you have to get the, the tape or CD from this morning by Rabbi Jason. He gave a great message on identity. Uh, one of many things he shared. 
Uh, but he says something that's really important. Your identity determines your destiny. Knowing who you are would determine how far you fulfill your prophetic destiny because so many of us are fighting fear, insecurity. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. You need to have your mind renewed, not only who God is, but who you are in Yeshua. The two things the enemy will do to lie to you and distort is the nature and character of God, but also who you are in Him. And some of you are under so much condemnation and shame, I just pick that up in my spirit. There's no condemnation in Yeshua. Amen? Amen. And, and you are, not only are you saved, but you're a child of the living God. I mean, that blows me away. See how great of a love that God has for us, that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are, 1 John 3, 1. And not only that, but He calls your friend. No longer do I call you servants, but I call you my friends. For a servant doesn't even know what his master is doing, but everything I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. You're a friend of God. And then he says, you're my bride. I love you. And how I many you know we're to love what he loves? Amen. We're to love the church. Yes. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for Ephesians 5, 25. And uh, I heard that Asher spoke something about this that's so prophetic, so important that we really learn to love the body. With all the flaws, some of you have been hurt in the church. I've been hurt in the church. Who hasn't been, you know? As they say, you won't find a perfect church. If you do find one, once you get there, it won't be perfect anymore because you're there. <laughs> you know, as the saying goes, why? Well, because we're imperfect people, right? But but God in his in his infinite wisdom, it's the wisdom of God. He talks about the church being the wisdom of God, the manifest wisdom of God. He's called you the ecclesia. Amazing. I mean, I, I think about this. I mean for, for me, I mean, this is a, a very interesting identity point because why didn't he cause, like, okay, I'll build my, my house or my synagogue. Later on he says, I'll, my house will be a house of prayer. But, but he says, I will build my ecclesia. Why would he take a Greek term that was coined in Athens 500 years before Jesus comes on the scene? The ecclesia, ek, out, kaleo, called, called out once, where people were called out of Athens to be part of the legislative body to make decisions concerning family, concerning whether you went to war against Sparta, or whether you made policies concerning where you determined who was a right or wrong in a dispute, land dispute, whatever. You, you were the judge. It was the called out one. And so what God is saying, I've called you out to legislate change in society. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And so we can shift the atmosphere. I, I talked about that with the Holy Spirit because it's, it's Christ in you, the Messiah within you, Colossians 1.27. You are carriers of the glory. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're carriers of the glory of God. And so you need to know your identity because I tell you, you know, when I, we have over 500 churches in Korea. And uh, I've met with the former president of Korea five times, three times in the Blue House. First time I got invited to go to the Blue House, I'm freaking out. Why? Because I can't speak Korean. And I'm just making a confession to you. I said, here I am, I'm a Korean American. I'm invited to be with President Lee in the Blue House to have lunch with him. And I'm going to have to use a translator the whole time. How humbling is this? And so I, everything within me said, I'm not going to go through this embarrassment. My insecurities came up and, and I canceled it. And then... Someone rebuked me, basically, when you're invited by a sitting president, you, you've got to accept it, you can't cancel it. So I said, okay. So I say yes, but here's what shift things around. All of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me, you are an apostle in the body of Christ, meaning another apostle in the marketplace. Know who you are. The moment that hit me, I began to realize, oh my God, I'm a child of the living God. I am royalty. I'm a royal priest. And so we have to get our minds renewed because the enemy will lie to us constantly. So I was going through my battle. And then once I got the revelation, yes, and so I got my best suit on. I met with the president. It was an amazing time. And I got to share with you, you know, he got healed. His, his uh, first lady got healed of arthritis in her knee. It led to us witnessing to uh, 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 his adult children. They ended up giving their lives to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about revival broke out in the Blue House with the president's family. It was amazing. But it was all based knowing your identity knowing who you are in Yeshua so I want to decree this over you that you would start renewing your thinking or take your thoughts captive to the beings of Jesus Christ are you ready for this? 
I declare a blessing over you that you would know who you are in, in Christ, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, that you're God's friend, God's child, and as his bride, you're called to reign in life together with Yeshua forever. Give me a big amen. 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 All right. Christ-like character. I decree a blessing over you that you be transformed from glory to glory into the image and character of Christ, growing and demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, this is a big deal because we're going through a crisis of character in our society. And, you know, as, as the whole world soccer movement is just appalled that there's so much corruption at the very echelon of FIFA. But, you know, Billy Graham said this. He said, the three greatest needs in a church is number one, integrity. Number two, integrity. And number three, integrity. It said this about the church. I had a friend of mine, he's a well-known evangelist who was speaking in Hollywood. And uh, because uh, they picked him up and put him in the hotel and the church building was just walking distance from where he was staying. But he wanted to see the sights. And so he got on the bus to go to Chinese Man Theater. And as he's going there and paid for the bus fare and got back to his seat, he realized that the bus driver had given him an extra change. Initially, he was just saying, no, it's not that much, and praise God, you know, God's blessing me. And he was thinking like that. And all of a sudden, he realized, no, this is wrong. So as he's getting off the bus, he said to, to the bus driver, you know, when you, I came on, you gave me extra change, and I wanted to return it. And the bus driver said, I know. I did it on purpose. I was at your meeting last night, and when you got on the bus, I recognized you, and I wanted to see if you practiced what you preached. Oh. It's a true story. And the question I would ask, what, what would you have done with that extra change? Rationalize it away? Say, well, it's not a big, not a big deal. It's not a cost bankruptcy in the bus company. But God is looking at faithfulness. He's looking at integrity. Faithful and little would be faithful for much. And uh, we're talking about this. You said, why, why is, you know, you're seeing the church growth around the world, but you still have so much corruption? Well, because, you know, we're not there yet, but we're being changed from glory to glory. We're being transformed into His image. See, God has predestined us. I believe in predestination, but here's my definition of predestination. is Romans 8, 29. He has predestined us to be conformed into the image of Jesus. From the very beginning, He wanted to have sons and daughters to reflect His image and His character. And so Christ-like character, holiness is everything to me. Everything. And how do I measure how... I'm becoming more Christ-like, and, and I'll tell you, personally for me, is how well I'm loving my wife. Because we hit a bump in the road around 20 years ago. And so from that point on, I've measured everything. If I'm loving my wife well, then I know I'm becoming more Christ-like, right? Because Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so if my wife is doing well, and she knows, and she's cherished, and my wife is amazing, she just constantly says, thank you for marrying me, thank you for marrying me. And we just have this amazing relationship that's really been heaven on earth, and I mean this without exaggeration. It wasn't always that way. You have to get my book, say, Goodbye to this Christianity, to, sh to know what happened. But this is God's, I believe, God's standard for us, to be like Jesus in character, also in power, we'll get into that, but in the art to be like him in character. So I want to pray that we go from glory to glory in this area, that we be holy as he is holy. And I want you to receive an impartation as I make this decree over you, all right? I decree a blessing over you that you would be transformed from glory to glory into the image and character of Christ, growing and demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God's kingdom, decree number six. I know I'm going over time, so just give me a little bit more time to get so I want to finish up and then pray for the sick. But we're going to do something else. We want to receive a prophetic offering in a moment. I decree a blessing over that you will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We'll preach the gospel of the kingdom with signs of one who's following. And uh, I don't have time to elaborate, but I want to encourage you. This is from Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Really be kingdom-minded. Be kingdom-hearted. And uh, the church is not the same as the kingdom. The church is to advance God's kingdom. And it's interesting, in, in the four Gospels, the church, Ecclesia, is mentioned only twice. The word kingdom, 129 times. And so God is after, the, is the, by the way, it's not the gospel of salvation, it's the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we have to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-hearted.
Decree number seven, healing and blessing. I decree a blessing. Over, let me finish up with God's kingdom. I want you to say an amen. I decree a blessing over you that you will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and will preach the gospel of the kingdom with signs of what is following. Amen. 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 Number seven, healing and blessing. I decree a blessing over you that God will heal you physically, that you will walk in divine health, and God will use you to heal others. Amen. Now, we're going to pray for the sick. I want to close out, give some words of knowledge, and just pray for you. And, uh, but I tell you, God is moving so powerfully. I'm seeing miracles like I've never seen. I'm talking about in the United States, not just in Africa or India or in China, but uh, even last year, a girl who was born blind in her right eye pulled me over as I was leaving the, the service, it was in Madison, Wisconsin, right on University of Wisconsin, and she said, would you pray for me? And I was in a hurry because I had to catch a car, a ride to Chicago, which is a two hour drive from Madison. And um, she pulled me over and just said, would you pray for me? And I said, okay. And I, so I just put my thumb on her eye. And when I took the thumb off, she started to scream. She said, I can see. I can see your face. I can, I can see your eyes. And I said, really? Are you kidding me? I mean, I was so shocked. I was not expecting that. And it's just amazing how there's something happening here, even in North America. And so I'll share some more, but uh, I want to make this decree over you. But I really want to encourage you. Let's just believe God for health. Not just healing, but health. Yes. Don't John to the Lord, I pray you prosper. Be in health, even as your soul prosper. So let me decree. A decree of blessing or read that God will heal you physically, that you will walk in divine health, and that God will use you to heal others. Yes. All right. Family, I decree a blessing over all your relationships, again with your family, that God will bless your marriage and the fruit of your womb, that He will bless your children, your grandchildren, your friendships in the church and the marketplace, that your entire family will be saved. Amen. Acts 16, 39, believe in the Lord Yeshua, and you and your family will be saved. And, and I believe it's, uh, it's harvest time for your household. Amen. I believe that we've got to believe that this is the year that God's going to bring our family members. Uh, especially for those with Jewish background, you're, they, you know, they've rejected you, they've uh, you know, basically disowned you, some of you, uh, for turning to Yeshua as your Messiah. But I believe, believe on the Lord Yeshua, you and your family will be saved. Amen. And I also believe that God wants to open someone's womb tonight. It was the son of blessing, Deuteronomy 28, is fruitfulness. And so if you've been contending for children, uh, when we pray for the sick, I want you also to believe God for our healing and that you would be fruitful as well. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let me decree this over you. All right. I decree a blessing over all your relationships, beginning with your family, that God will bless your marriage and the fruit of your womb, and he will bless your children, your grandchildren, your friendship in his church and in the marketplace, and that your entire family will be saved. Give me a big amen. amen. And I'm so blessed because not only my immediate family, but my wife's family, she came from a Roman Catholic background. All of them have come to know the Lord. All my relatives that I know of in the United States have all come to save. It's been amazing. And, uh, and we give them all the glory and all the praise. Last one, uh, number nine. We have two more. Prosperity. I decree a blessing over your finances that God would break the spirit of poverty off of you and your bloodline. And that he would prosper you financially. That God would bless you with the power to gain wealth and that you would advance his kingdom with your generosity. Now, what I want to do is I want to take up a spontaneous prophetic offering. I leaned over to Benjamin, and when he said, we're not going to receive an offering, uh, just those who would like to give in the back. But, but I felt, you know what? This decree really works best when there's a prophetic act with it. And all of it is going to Tacoon. It's not going to me. This is going to their ministry. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do this very quickly. We're going to just pray and obey. Just pray, ask the Holy Spirit now what you're to give in this offering, because I want you to hold this offering in your hand. And I want to decree a blessing over you. I want to break the spirit of poverty off of you and your bloodline. I tell you something, you know, it's amazing, even though uh, in the Old Testament we see how God says over and over again, I want to bless you and prosper you financially. Deuteronomy 8.18, He gives us the power to gain wealth. Uh, you know, that He wants to bless you abundantly. Why? For the purpose of of being a blessing to the nations. But, you know, the spirit of poverty came into the church, and I can tell you when it came in, in the 4th century. It came in, we were talking about this earlier, it came in through Gnosticism. Gnosticism basically was influenced by uh, Greek philosophy, dualism, 
Plato's philosophy of two worlds, a Gnosticism embraced that, that the material world was evil and only the spiritual world was good. And so it led to the monastic movement because they did not love the world, and they took that completely out of context because we're to be salt and light to the world, right? And so they withdrew from the world, and they had to make vows, three vows, a vow of chastity, because even sex was material, it was carnal, it was worldly. Uh, a vow of poverty, money was evil. And a vow of obedience. Now, where in the word does it say that you can't get married and have a relationship under marriage, right? Nowhere. And yet to this day, a whole denomination has sprung up where if you want to serve God, you can't get married. You have to be celibate to this day. Well, it's also the influence of church. And I have to say is the whole church, because that Greek philosophy, instead of being rooted in the word of God and the Torah, we've been influenced more by dualism and Gnosticism, and, uh, and especially Docetic Gnosticism, which was extreme, that they said that Jesus didn't even come in the flesh. He was just a spirit. And of course, you know, we don't believe that. We believe in the body, bodily resurrection of our Lord. And so that spirit of poverty is in the church, and I want to break that off of you and your bloodline. So I'm going to ask you to hold your offering in your hand. Just stand up as I make this decree. And just hold your offering in your hand. If you're writing a check, you can write it to Tacoon. If you are giving cash, you need an envelope. I don't know if ushers are um, available to... All right. All right, just hold your offering. If you didn't come ready... You may want to just take a piece of paper and just say, I'll bring the offering tomorrow. Here's my pledge for tonight. And just do something dismissed to pick up your children. Again, forgive me for going a little bit over. But number 10, I decree a blessing over you to be led by the, His Spirit and His Word, that you would know and obey His will, and that you would fulfill your prophetic destiny. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much that you would seal this, these decrees. And for those who, I, I want to encourage you to get the CD, get your mind renewed, go over this decree, and just really be transformed by the Word of God. But Father, I really pray that something will shift, that this is a Kairos moment for me, to be here 20 minutes out from the very place I made that quality decision to give my heart to you, May 29th, and to speak at this conference at this time. I feel that, Lord, it is a Kairos moment that you orchestrated. Truly, the steps of righteous men are ordered by you. Amen. And I'm believing, Lord God, that you would take us now from glory to glory, that you would bring about the fulfillment of uh, the prophetic words, that the glory of the knowledge of God the, uh, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In Adam 2.14, that the glory of their latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. That you would take us, that there would be greater swells of glory that would hit your ecclesia, your church, and these last days for your end time harvest. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, let's give them a clap of Let's thank God for it tonight. I'm going to ask, if you need to go, if you need to go, if you need to pick up your children and bring them back, um, and if you're healthy, you're fine, you do well. But to those who would like prayer for healing, uh, I want to do two, two prayers. Uh, the first prayer is the healing of the heart. So I know in a group this size, there may be some who have never given their heart to Yeshua. And, um, and you may be brought by a family member or friend, but I want to give you an opportunity to give your heart to the Lord. And uh, when we do this, why don't we pray this prayer together, just out loud, so that we can just encourage those who don't know the Lord. Because you heard my testimony, it was intentional for me to share, if God could deliver me from the dominion of darkness, transfer me into His Son. And, and not only transform me, but then call me to be a pastor. And to bless me with a beautiful family, with uh, wonderful, wonderful kids and grandchildren. He wants to do the same for you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Repeat after me, but make, your, make this your prayer. Just say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father forgive me for my sins. I repent. Yeshua, I give my heart to you. Be the Lord of my life. And by your grace, I will follow you and obey you all the days of my life. Now, if you pray that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to take courage. I'm going to ask you to, in a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Now, I know there are two groups of people who are making that first time commitment, but some of you need to make a recommitment, and you pray that prayer as a recommitment to the Lord. Why am I asking you to raise your hand? Because Jesus said this, if you accept me before men, I'll accept you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I mean, there are Christians who are dying right now in the Middle East. I just came from Egypt. A few months ago, 21 Egyptians were beheaded by ISIS 
in Libya. And they're taking a stand for, for, for Jesus around the world. And so I'm going to ask you in a moment, if you just made a commitment or a recommitment to Yeshua as your Messiah, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand boldly. Are you ready? One, two, three. Boldly raise your hand. Amen. Wave it at me. God bless your hands all over this place. And God help me. If you seal this, come on, let's give Jesus a hand. Let's give him a hand. What a great Messianic congregation. Be in the word and prayer. Share your faith and get baptized in Yeshua's name. I want to just encourage you to pray for the sick. We pray for the sick every week in our church. And it's just something that we've developed a culture for the supernatural. And uh, it's amazing. So I pray for this impartation. And I just now pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance. And give you the shalom of Yeshua HaMashiach. God bless you. It was great to be with you on the night of my anniversary of conversion. And I hope you come out to LA and visit me. Check out our website, our church, and our, our, our conferences, and uh, our, our weekly uh, webcast is on the air all the time. So God bless you. I'm going to be at the book uh, table and sign some books and meet you and greet you before I take off. God bless you. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor Chase.